Hi, I'm Rolanda Watts, and I am so glad that you're enjoying my YouTube channel. And have I got a story for you today. Some of you may remember back in the day when I did the Rolanda show on television, I held a big town hall meeting where we talked about being young and racist. I had on the KKK, a couple of skinhead kids, it wasn't that I wanted to give a bunch of racists a platform, but I wanted to speak with them and get a better understanding of what it was like to be young and racist in America. Well, I met a young man by the name of Jeff Shope, and at that time, Jeff was a very bad person. Uh, I'll just racist. say it. That we need a white homeland, and no matter what happens, we're going to have that white homeland, any means necessary, Bye. because the country's being overrun by immigrants. We've got the mud flood coming across the border from Mexico. And what's the mud flood? Mexicans? Is that what you call Mexican immigration? Mud floods? Yep. Okay. The mud flood is coming across our borders, taking our jobs. Do, have you ever met a Mexican person? Sure. I live in a ghetto. Um, this is the voicemail that you might hear if you call. This is their message on their machine. Let's play that. You have reached the National Socialist Movement. We will be judge, jury, and executioner. Your future and your children's future is on the line. It's time to enlist in the fight for a white homeland. Do your parents agree with what you're doing? I'm not going to talk about my parents. No, they don't agree with it. They don't? No. I bet they're ashamed. If a person should be ashamed of another person for being proud of their race, then there's a problem. He was 22 years old. He was the leader of the National Socialist Party and would go on to lead one of the biggest Nazi groups in America. Yeah, he was not a very pleasant young man. But there was something about him where I just had to believe that Jeff had hope. Well, skip to almost 30 years later. I get a Christmas letter from Jeff Shope, of all people. Now, I didn't know what to think when I got this email, but let me read the letter to you. Hello, Rolanda. If you don't mind, there's something I would like to say to you. Back in the 1990s, I was a guest on your TV show. My behavior back then was reprehensible, disrespectful, and wrong. I am deeply and truly sorry for the painful and horrible rhetoric I spewed on your show and anything I may have said that caused you and or others to feel any pain, trauma, or disrespect. This heartfelt and sincere apology is well overdue. Almost 30 years later, but I hope you will find it in your heart to hear me and know this is coming from a good place. I've done a lot of damage over the years, and unfortunately, I went on to lead the largest Nazi group in America for 25 years. I walked away from that garbage. Jeff goes on to say that he has changed his ways, that he is not a racist anymore, thanks to meeting a black man and a Muslim woman who turned him around. How did that happen? Well, you know me, I had to set up an interview with Jeff and find out what in the world happened because he went a long way from the Rolanda show in the 90s to talking with me on Rolanda On Demand today. Listen to this and ask the question, can racists really change? Can people have a change of heart and a change of mind? I think that's something that would make Martin Luther King very happy as we're celebrating his day. But you take the listen and make the decision on your own. I had a nice long talk with Jeff, and for my opinion, I'm very proud of him because he came a long way from that fateful day on the Rolanda show. Let's go back and take a look at, at what Jeff was like then, and then you'll meet Jeff today. Can racists really change? That's the question we're asking today, and I think that's something worth talking about. One of the final straws for me, we're sitting across from each other and she has a similar story and she's talking about, and she's like, you know, Jeff, this ideology, this movement made me feel like less than a person growing up. It made me feel ugly. It made me feel hated. And I could just like, you talk about energy in the room and like a, a vibe or 
I don't know how to explain it, but like this energy, I could feel her pain. I could That's feel called empathy. <laughs> yes, yes, empathy. Yes, it was, Rolanda, it was incredible. It, it was like getting kicked in the chest by a horse. Okay, so I'm here a little early. I really don't know what to expect. The last time I saw Jeff was almost 25 years ago and he thought the whole country should be split up. Kind of like what those those Trump rioters thought. Things. And I just um, don't know what to expect, but I know that he says he has changed. And what he doesn't know is I thought he might. You know, he was only 22 years old and we'll see what happened? He was only 22 when he came on my stage, uh, spewing, wearing a swastika and spewing all of that um, white supremacy stuff. And uh, he says he's changed. And we're going to hear his story today, Jeff Shope. So I'm really excited. Jeff. Hey, Jeff. Hey. How are you? Good, how are you? Good. Look at you all grown up. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> How are you? Really good. 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 This is so exciting. I never, I never thought this day would come. You didn't. No. You know, you know something, Jeff. I got to tell you something. I back in the day when we did the show, I thought if anybody I thought it would be you I just thought you you know not that you I don't know I, I just thought I said he's gonna change one day I don't know why I thought that but doggone it here you are this was a great Christmas gift <laughs> I wish it wouldn't have took me so long that's that's the that's the big regret but um you know better late than never I, I guess it's, yeah, it's, but you have such an incredible story to tell because you were a badass back there. And <laughs> 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 oh my God, but Jeff, this is just, I mean, what an incredible story. I mean, just our story from, from start to finish is crazy enough, but just your own journey. Go back, Jeff, and 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 let's recount who was Jeff, because you said some stuff on that show. Oh my gosh, <laughs> we're gonna uh, we're gonna uh, go back in time here today. So um, <laughs> it, it was uh, first of all, uh, and I, I know we already uh, are, uh, we already talked about this, but um, I am so sorry for how I behaved uh, on your show back. Um, however many it was what 20 something years oh. I mean it, what a, what an embarrassment um, but um, at the time I, I truly believed in in what I was saying and um, you know the work I do today uh, tries to help get people out of that uh, extremism uh, we first met when I was on your your program back in the 90s that's and, right uh, yeah so that was uh, this is uh, quite a reunion <laughs> yeah I know and do you know something Jeff? That show is on YouTube and we've gotten almost a million views. Oh, wow. And it's just amazing that the talk about race and extremism and all of those things hasn't changed. And look at today. I mean, look at what we're looking at after the, 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 the siege of the Capitol. You know, a lot of that has it. I don't know what maybe from your voice. Tell us, has it grown or is it just being exposed? Well, um, it's it's hard to say for a hundred percent exactly, but I, I think it's definitely grown. Um, I left in uh, March of two thousand, early March two thousand nineteen, and then I started speaking out against uh, uh, hate and extremism uh, in uh, about August August of two thousand nineteen. Um, but at the time I'd left, uh, these organizations were definitely uh, definitely picking up steam and. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of the talk, a lot of the extremist talk is becoming more and more mainstream. And this was something that especially bringing people out and just from having that experience of being in that world for so many years, looking looking back on that and having people that are reaching out and, and talking and, and trying to, you know, you know, make those decisions if they're going to leave of what they're going to do. Um, seeing some of those talking points where people are talking about civil war, race war, mm -hmm. those sort of things in, in the mainstream is not good. It's, it's definitely, um, it's, it's really uh, uh, hard to see and, and listen to. And 
it, it, it certainly increases the number of people that are reaching out to us for help that are, that are trying to find their way out. Right. Are you finding that people are trying to get out? Because, you know, I, I can only imagine like any group or gang or whatever you call it, um, it you you look to your right, you look to your left, everybody around you is is involved in that. So how do you get out without going on a witness program? I mean, you almost have to like you are so entrenched in it that it's so hard to get out. It, I mean, are you are do you find that there's many coming to you saying, get me out of here? Or are you finding that you have to work harder to go pull people out? Usually it's, it's best for them to, to reach out to us. It's to go to go in and pull them out is is um, is a lot harder because you're going to run up against the, um, a lot of resistance. You know, when you okay. when you're going to someone, you know, they have to um, uh, they have to be starting to question things in their own minds. And, and um, just to uh, give a little background, and I know you asked and I didn't really get into it, but yeah, cause I want to know, I, there's so much I want to know is like, how did you get in? And we probably talked about that 25 years ago, but just to put it in perspective now, like how did you get wrapped up in that anyway? You were so, you were one of the top dog leaders. I mean, you were the extreme of the extremists. <laughs> if you yeah. think about it, you were one of the top leaders in, in these groups back then. And you vigilantly believed in what you were saying. Yes. And, and then what was the thing that turned your heart? I mean, how in the world did that happen? So yeah, start talking. <laughs> As we used to say on the show, Jeff, you got some splaining to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember that. <laughs> hey, y'all, I can't wait to see you in my voice acting masterclass. For those of you who are really serious about becoming voice actors, this is the opportunity for you. In six weeks, you will be in a totally different place as an artist. And I want to help you put that voice to work. Go to Rolanda.com and check it out. You'll see the details of what I offer and you might want to even set up a discovery call to see if this is the right fit for you. But stop hesitating. Stop waiting. Stop putting off. Stop going, well, because it'll always be an excuse. Take control of your life. Take action now. Be a voice actor and come work with me. Rolanda.com. Guys, Manny Cabo here. You guys might recognize me from tiny little show on NBC called The Voice, or Telemundo's La Voz, or maybe even one of the lead singers of The Wizards of Winter Christmas Spectacular. I'm here to talk to you guys about Rolando Watt's masterclass for voiceover artists. I got to tell you, when I first delved into this industry, so many of my friends would say, Manny, you want to learn voiceovers? You got to take Rose class. And they hit the nail on the head with this one. Because after the six week intensive masterclass, not only did I feel inspired and empowered, but above all educated with all the latest trends and tips and techniques from industry professionals that Rolanda will bring on to showcase to help you leverage your skills as well. So folks, if you're looking to really up your game and delve into the voiceover world, then take Rolanda Watts masterclass. You'll be glad you did. And Rolanda, thank you so much for inspiring me to continue to do the things that I love with my voice. You're a rock star. And for those of you out there looking for the best voiceover masterclass, Rolanda's the way to go. Oh, and by the way, you're welcome. Take care, guys, and good luck. <laughs> yes. Um, so 27 years is a long time, Rolanda. That's how long I was involved. So I got involved at a young age. Um, uh, I probably didn't explain this on the show because I was I kept it I kept it pretty quiet. But w one of the the re different people get into this stuff for different reasons. For some, it's the brotherhood or the camaraderie. For some, they're just searching for something. Some, it's the ideology. Everybody, a lot of people sometimes it's trauma induced. You know, there's different reasons why people get involved in this stuff. But for me, it was um, my grandfather had fought in. Uh, in World War II on the German side, he fought um, my, my mother's side of the family had come over from Germany. And um, my grandfather, my great uncles, um, they had fought in the Third Reich. And now it was not something that my family promoted or anything like that. In fact, my, my family, my parents especially, were very much against my involvement in this. But I just had this fascination uh, about the Third Reich and, and all that from a, such a young age that I 
I was going to join, you know, that it was just, it was my destiny. I felt like it was something that I was going to do. And a lot of things that people don't understand about extremists getting involved in this sort of thing. And, and sometimes it's hard to explain it in the sense because people don't want to hear it. But um, a lot of guys, when they get out, they'll say it was all about hate. It was all about hate. I just hated everybody. And I see them when, it, when they're saying that. And now I was the leader of the, of the National Socialist Movement for 25 of those years. And by the time I left, that was the largest organization of its kind in the country. So, and what did you stand for, for people who aren't familiar with that? What, do you, what did that stand for? The National Socialist Movement is basically the Nazi party. It's, no. Yeah, yeah. So that, uh, unfortunately, you know, that, that's part of the past. But what I wanted to explain is, is, to reach the people that are in it and to, to get them to consider coming out, to get them to come out to, to is, is these are people that are trying to be heard and things like that. But what I, what I want to say is hate is there and the hate is definitely developed there. And it's definitely about hate. I'm, you saw it firsthand uh, mm -hmm. before 25 years ago on the show when we were there and it's definitely part of it, but it's not, hate is I mean y'all hated everybody everybody everybody, <laughs> everybody. you yeah. caught the Mexicans were the mudslugs black people need to be in their own neighborhood you hated everybody how do you live like that it it's hard it's it's basically waking up every single day and you are at war with the world you're at war with half of the white people you're at war with some of the other white nationalist organizations you're at war with um all of the people of color, you know, and, and different religious backgrounds. I mean, it's, it's a, it's, it's not a good lifestyle by any means, but what I, what I want to explain is that people getting involved in it quite often, they believe, they truly believe they're doing something good and noble. And this is, this is where I think a lot of people get tripped up is because that belief that you're doing something good and noble that holds you, that holds you in it. And that keeps you there. That keeps, it's just like a cult. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't like it when people would call it a cult when I was in there, different, uh, girls that I was dating one after the other would say, Jeff, this is like a cult. This is like a cult. And I'm thinking, why do these girls keep saying that there's something wrong with these girls? Why do they keep saying this? There was something wrong with me. I didn't see it. All right. You didn't see it. Yeah. Wow. Well, you were, we, yeah, you were, you believed it. You, you drank the, the Kool-Aid, shall I say? Yeah. Yeah. What in the world happened? I mean, how does somebody with such a hardened, cold, hateful heart turn into this new Jeff? That's a great question. And um, for me, it was the meeting people from the so-called other. You know, you, talk, you hear about people talking about othering and, you know, um, meeting people that were different, meeting people that, um, spoke to me like a human being that treated me with respect. I had met um, a black musician by the name of Daryl Davis, who actually works with my nonprofit organization uh, currently. Um, and that's called Beyond Barriers. And what we do is, is the concept of Beyond Barriers is you're behind a barrier. You've put it up yourself. It's a, it's, you've put this barrier up in your mind and you can't see beyond it or an echo chamber or a bubble, whatever, you know, um, example one wants to use, but you're in this barrier. You can't see the humanity of other people when you're stuck behind that barrier. You, you can't see it. So meeting Daryl Davis. And then uh, about a year later after in 2016, I met Daryl. And in 2017, I met a Muslim woman by the name of Dia Khan and, and, uh, Dia, well, Daryl's like a brother to me now. And Dia's like a sister. And, and uh, Daryl is black. Yes. Okay. Now, yeah. wait a minute. You, you, how did you meet them? Because you wouldn't be any, you, you wouldn't have been close to me had you not been on my show. <laughs> right. So, right. I mean, let's be real. So how did you, how did you, how did you happen to meet a Muslim woman and a black man who changed your heart? Meeting people that were different meeting people that um, spoke to me like a human being that treated me with respect. I had met, um, a uh, black musician by the name of Daryl Davis, who actually works with my nonprofit organization uh, currently, um, and that's called Beyond Barriers. And what we do is, is the concept of Beyond Barriers is you're behind a barrier. You've put it up yourself. It's a, it's, you've put this barrier up in your mind 
and you can't see beyond it or an echo chamber or a bubble, whatever, you know, um, example one wants to use, but you're in this barrier. You can't see the humanity of other people when you're stuck behind that barrier. You, you can't see it. So meeting Daryl Davis and then uh, about a year later after in 2016, I met Daryl. And in 2017, I met a Muslim woman by the name of Dia Khan and, and, uh, Adia, well, Daryl's like a brother to me now, and Dia's like a sister. And, and uh, Daryl is black. Yes. Okay. Now, yeah. wait a minute. You, you, how did you meet them? Because you wouldn't be any. Look, you, you wouldn't have been close to me had you not been on my show. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, right. I mean, let's be real. So, how did you? How did you? How did you happen to meet a Muslim woman and a black man who changed your heart? And, th and this is that's, that's a great question, because under normal circumstances, I wouldn't meet these people. But um, being in the movement, Daryl was working on a film, Daryl Davis. Now he's a, he's a famous musician. He played with like Little Richard, Chuck Berry, all these kind of uh, famous, wonderful, talented musicians. But he was also his hobby. A lot of when they talk about him in the press, they'll say it's his hobby. But um, what his hobby was, was Daryl would, and he's written a book about this. He goes and, and meets people that are in the Klan or white nationalist movements and befriends them and brings them out. He's brought out like 200 Klansmen out of the movement. So what? I'm meeting with him for his movie that he was working on called Accidental Courtesy. And um, normally when I would get calls from press or, you know, I'd done all kinds of different documentaries and things over the years. So that was nothing new. But in this case, for whatever reason, I didn't even ask, like, who was who was doing this show? Because normally I would do a little bit of background or research. And I was just like, OK, this sounds interesting. I'll go. And I didn't do any checking, which is really odd. But um, so I didn't even know who I was meeting. So I met him and uh, we started talking and we hit it off right away. And, you know, and I spewed out the things that I felt like I needed to say for the movement because I'm going to do documentaries to get the word out. Is, is and it's stuff like what? garbage racist garbage and you, know? you said that to this man yeah i i said the most radical thing i said sitting there was something like um and i think it was there was just a little clip in that film um accidental courtesy but i said something like i'll fight to the last bullet for my people and when daryl and i speak out today you know we go around the country and speak out and not so much with covid but when we were doing that um you know, he tells people that he says, when I met Jeff, he said he'd fight for the last bullet for his, uh, to the last bullet for his people. And, and, uh, um, you know, that's the kind of stuff that I was, I was saying then, but, uh, he got to me and you know how he got to me was he was able to show me his, his humanity. He talked about how racism hurt him as a child. And when he was in the boy Scouts about seven years old, he's at a boy scout March and, People, he was the only black child there and people were throwing rock, adults, I believe, were throwing rocks at him mm. and he went home and he couldn't understand why he thought they didn't like the Boy Scouts. And when he found out like it's it's a, it's terrible. It's I mean, it's a horrible story. And when he found out that they hated him because he was black, he says he goes, I don't know. I didn't understand this. How can they hate me when they don't even know me? And it's that little question. Mm -hmm. That question. And I'm I'm seeing this, you know, this good person sitting across from me and how that hurt him. And I'm thinking to myself, you know what, this idea, you know, it wasn't me that did it. Maybe it wasn't even my organization that had did it. But how many other people is this affecting? But I still wasn't ready to leave. I, I still but it, it, he planted a, a really important seed that helped me later on. And when I met Dia Khan. Uh, she was a Muslim filmmaker and um, I spent a lot of time with Dia because I was the main uh, subject or, or whatever of her film, White Right Meeting the Enemy. Wow. And she had a similar story to Daryl. And um, this was even much harder for me. This was like the one of the final straws for me. We're sitting across from each other and she has a similar story and she's talking about and she's like, you know, Jeff, this ideology, this movement made me feel like less than a person growing up. It made me feel ugly. It made me feel hated. And I could just like, you talk about energy in the room and like a, a vibe or I don't know how to explain it, but like this energy, I could feel her pain. 
I could That's called empathy. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Empathy. Yes. Yeah. It was Rolanda. It was incredible. It, it was like getting kicked in the chest by a horse. And mm -hmm. for me, I didn't leave immediately, but you could, the cameraman caught part, part of this or, or some of it. And he like zoomed in on my eyes in the film because you could see that it got to me and people, people that have seen it, they'll, they'll say, yeah, what we saw that we knew that, you know, you were going to wow. be out. So that, that's that amazing. That's amazing how one thing, because you wonder, you know, it says, let peace begin with me, but what does that really look like? You know, and, and would we all learn the skills of, of, of being empaths, you know? Um, it, it, when you saw the, the riot at the Capitol and all the, just the degradation of democracy, um, in my opinion, what went through your mind? I mean, you, you know some of those folks, <laughs> or uh, at least, you know, no, knew. Yeah, um, it, was, it was hard. It was hard to watch that. Um, there's, you know, there's, there's a crossover there with the, the riots and stuff at the Capitol. Some of those people are white supremacists. Some are not. Some were, you know, just hardcore Trump supporters. You had QAnon there. You had Oath Keepers and militias. And then, of course, you know, white supremacists and stuff as well. So you had all these groups with these different grievances uh, coming together and, and attacking the Capitol. I, it, 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 it really, uh, it's hard to, um, it's hard to process in a lot of ways, but these are things that the movement predicted back in those days that would say, this is the kind of stuff that's coming. So with some of the people that we're working with that have come out, even people that have been out for many years, uh, some of them would say things like, it's hard to see this because we predicted these things. These are things that the movement right. wanted. These, we were the dividers. We were the ones hoping that kind of thing would happen or trying to escalate it or trying to accelerate it. So um, it, it was hard to see. It was definitely uh, difficult. Yeah. What is that? They say the past is a prologue to the future or something. It's, it's uh, yeah. And that's why we were doing the show. And that's why you were up there telling all the business because yeah, that's where we were then, which we were trying to say, hey, you guys, here we are. FBI is now calling white supremacy groups like the biggest threat to America in terms of terrorism. That's just, that's so frightening. What can we do? I mean, those of us who want a better world, um, who are pissed off by the way that, that America is, quite honestly, what can we do? I mean, because... I think what's happened is we've get we've it, we you don't have to look at TV or or hear about something. We've gotten to see who, who our neighbors are, who our friends are, who our coworkers are, and um, how do you reach out to somebody and say, "Hey, you know, really, can we embrace love?" I mean, it sounds so woo woo, but that's really what it is. It's either love or hate. You're right. You're right. It absolutely is. And I mean, the polarization right now in the country, it's not even just on racial lines. It's like between the two political parties, the Democrats and the Republicans, there's so much deep seated animosity and um, people wanting revenge and retribution. Mm -hmm. And it's it's vicious. It goes back and forth and back and forth. And as one of the promises I made to myself when I left the movement, I said, you know, I spent 27 years being a divider, being somebody that that you know, promoted this kind of stuff or that hope for these kind of things in the past. And I will never, ever be a divider again. You know, so a lot of times when I get asked about these things and, and people will say, well, you know, tell us what uh, Donald Trump is a white supremacist or, or tell us this or that, you know, and, and they, they have a political agenda. I'm very careful not to alienate either side because I understand because of my past experience, because of that lived experience, I understand how important dialogue is, how important listening is and, and um, hearing grievances from each side, even if those grievances are completely wrong or ugly or, or hypocritical. If a person, if you take away someone's voice or, or shut them down, a lot of times it, it pushes them behind those barriers. It pushes them into those echo chambers of hate. And um, uh, as you said earlier in, in, the, in, the, um, in our talk, um, you're, uh, when you're in something like this, and, and, I, and I mentioned it's like a cult, mm -hmm. everyone that you know, almost everyone, in some yeah. cases, 
everyone is involved. So when you leave, you're leaving your social, you know, your support networks, your social networks, your friends, sometimes your family, sometimes your families have cut you off because you went, I was fortunate. My family didn't do that, but um, I know a lot of people as, especially from coming out of a leadership role like that, I knew some of the struggles that a lot of the people were going through there and, and understand that. So trying to heal the nation and trying to heal um, hate and, and replacing it with love and, and all that empathy is, is huge. Compassion is huge. Listening dialogue is, 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 is where it's at. And one of the things about when you say about like people from the outside looking at how can they do something or how can they change um it's easy. You hear a lot of rhetoric about like, oh, let's punch a Nazi in the face or let's dox them. Let's do this or that or let's scream at them. And that, none of that stuff works. In fact, what it what that does is that pushes a person. It's like sure. pushing a dog into a corner. They feel attacked and they, they will buckle down typically. Now, once in a while, I, I, I think out of all the people I know that are out, one or two of them maybe left because they were doxxed or they were attacked or things like that. But that's rare. Most people that have left are leaving out of empathy. It's meeting people like, like the uh, examples that I gave, and there was a whole lot more, but those are just two, you know, people that are public. So I can speak about them. There's others I, you know, um, I could tell the story, but I don't want to give their name. When you said you're talking to both sides, you know, the extremists and the people who wish they weren't, um, and you don't take sides. You just kind of play that middle thing. And I'm thinking, now Jeff sees what I was going through as a talk show host, right? <laughs> but it is as a journalist, you know, you play that, you know, you play that line. It's almost like you're the, the big, the big brother and the little brother and the parents are having an argument. And you just kind of, you know, you hear both sides but with the ultimate goal of communicating. But that's so important. And I just I just think that, you know, we all need to take a class on tolerance or something, you know, and take, you know, I've had very open conversations with my girlfriend. I remember a girlfriend of mine said, come, come here. I got to show you something. I was at her house and she pulled out a Confederate flag and she said, I had no idea this was so offensive. And she said, I bought it because I just thought it was a replica, you know, just a, a relic of the South. And she said, and I can't imagine that I would have anything that would hurt you so badly. And I, and I thought that was such an educable moment, you know, for me to talk about what that meant. You, my, my parents made me go to a KKK rally one time. Our whole family went just so we could see that this was real. This was real. These people are plotting to kill us. <laughs> but I guess that's what gave me the courage to talk to you and the KKK guys that day. But, um, but, the, but the transformation, the reinvention of your soul has been just an amazing story, Jeff. So w give me the story you were going to tell me. I mean, how, because we're picking up nuggets of how we can give to humanity because that's what we need right now. Yeah, it's well in, if, if we're talking about the movement specifically, one of the, one of the things with them is at least in their, in their minds is that everything is about respect, like lots of people to, to get out just because they were able to listen and have that dialogue. And, and, um, and just like you said, it's exactly what you did as a journalist, what you do as a journalist and, and having sometimes to listen to really ugly and hateful things. Um, like if we rewound when I was on your show, you know, 25 years ago. And we will. <laughs> Those you will be things, rewound. <laughs> those kind of things. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I, I, I had to take a dig at myself there. <laughs> I know. But Jeff, your letter to me was so heartfelt. And, you know, you, I appreciate the apology. You really didn't need to. But I, I because I'm so happy that, that, that you saw the light. But you're such a gentleman. Your mama done good with you. <laughs> Because you wrote the nicest letter, the nicest letter. So I appreciate that. Yeah. You know, I think if people have a go-to strategy, then they don't have knee-jerk reactions. One of the most effective things, and I know I'm jumping all over the place. because Me too, but this is so <laughs> juicy. Go on. 
but it, it's being able to touch the humanity of the person sitting across from you. That is, we found there's, uh, there's different things that get to different people, but the, by far the most effective strategy is that humanity. So Daryl and Dia, how they reached me is how we do it at Beyond Barriers as well, is being, being able to touch that humanity. And we have some uh, victims' rights advocates that work with us and things like that, people that have been harmed by hate, people that have been affected by it. Um, when we talk about like what they teach in school and things like that, and they talk about the Holocaust, and, and I think that's important and it's good, but a lot of people, um, when they hear that, it, it's removed. It's like, well, that happened back in 1930s and 40s. It doesn't affect me now. But if you bring in somebody or if you tell a story, like someone sitting in front of you, like when I met Daryl Davis or Dia Khan, and here's someone, here's a person that has been affected by hate and they're telling their story and they're willing to sit there and, and speak with you. It's those stories because, and this is where I was kind of going earlier in the conversation where I was saying about what brings people into these movements. It's not hate that brings them there typically. Some of them, yes, it's a smaller percentage, but most people think that they're doing something good and honorable and noble. And for me, when I started seeing that, hey, this idea that I have or this ideology I have is harmful to so many people, so many people around the world, it can't be good and noble. It can't be those things that I thought it was back in those days. So when the individual starts to see how this ideology is harming other people and how, it, how that affects them, good people, I think that's, it's touching that humanity. It's like, um, I was speaking at a, 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 a conference of, of rabbis uh, a few weeks ago or about a month ago. <laughs> yep, I'm sorry, but you come a long way, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 it was, yes, yes. <laughs> very interesting, very interesting. But all these rabbinical leaders from different parts of the country that were on this program. And um, I was explaining that because that's something they wanted to know about as well is how do you know, how does change like this happen? How can people engage with it? And I explained about how, you know, walking somebody out and one of the rabbis had said, and I really liked his example. He goes, Jeff, he goes, I'm picturing this in my head. He says, I'm picturing this little pathway and a small window on the barriers. And the window opens when you're, when you're touching that humanity. And he goes, that's when we go through the window and, you know, touch their hearts. And I was like, yes, 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 <laughs> yes exactly. You got it. I said, I'm going to use your example. It's so good. But that was, that was it. That's it. Touching the humanity. Because most people, even people in these hateful ideologies, and it's a part some people don't want to hear. It's hard to hear, I think, for some people, especially if you've been a victim of hate mm -hmm. um, or, or if it's something that's, that's um, caused fear or anxiety in you. And, and um, it, it's done that to so many people. So it's mm -hmm. hard to hear those things. But if, if you're able to touch the humanity of that person, of that individual, you really do have an opportunity to help bring, help bring them out or plant a seed. It might not help it happen instantly, but right. you start thinking about it. And, and then, mm -hmm. then when you're ready, then you're, you're coming out. Some of them might, might be a snap of a finger and coming out, but usually it takes a little bit of time. They need to go back and think about that stuff. And, and uh, for me it did. And, and I wish I would have left uh, sooner, but um, you left when it was time, you know, there you, in God's time as grandmothers would say, you know, um, but it, however long it took, it, 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 thank God it happened. I'm just so proud of you. And I'm so relieved. Did you get a lot of heat from the boys back in the club? I mean, did, 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 did the extremists like call you names and hurt your feelings? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard when you leave um, in that sense. Um, and I, I don't want to discourage anybody from it either. You know, I, I don't want to well, say gotta be courageous. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it does take, go ahead. I'm sorry. And, no, no. I was just saying it, it takes a dog on a boatload of courage to do something like that. But I think that's, that's also part of what we're stepping into now, whether it's our politicians or it's our friends who don't remain silent it's have the balls. I mean, have the courage to do the right thing, whatever, you know, whatever that is, you know, cause that could be argued back and forth too. But, but um, 
yeah, it takes a lot of courage to do what you did, what you've done. And so th that's another thing you have to instill in people to get them out. <sighs> Yeah. And for some, you know, it's you, you get threats and then there's people that, that um, they, they're so, they're so um, polarized and so blind to the way things are outside of that bubble or beyond those barriers. They, they can't see it. So one of the things that bothered me quite a bit when I first got out, um, when I first got out, I'm getting all these emails. I'm getting people that are reaching out when I just set up my own personal uh, website. Um, and I was getting all these contacts and they were saying, oh, so you're a communist now. Uh, you're, you're Antifa now. You're this and that. You know? And I'm thinking, why are, why are they thinking this? Why do they think that just because I left the movement, now I'm some like communist extremist on the other side. But I had to remember... That's how we thought. I thought that way too when someone left that. And sometimes people, when they leave, they do go, they flip to the other far extreme, you know, and, and they become, because they're not de-radicalized. They're still extreme. They just switch teams basically. Right, right. <laughs> it's like an addiction. Yes, it, it's very much like an addiction. So, and we can, we compare that to like um, uh, one of the, the ladies that had come out uh, with me when I left or soon after she had said too, she goes, this is like, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous in some ways when you leave, because it's like an addiction, you you're missing that uh, those things in your life and, and things like that. But they're so polarized that they don't see that just because someone leaves that they automatically think you have to be uh, working on, the, you know, the far, the farthest right. side, their enemies, you know, like it's strange. So, um, I have to remember that I thought that way too. So have patience and, and explain it to them. Like, Hey guys, I'm not a communist. I'm not, a, I'm not a racist, but that doesn't make me a communist or somebody that's on the extreme other side either, you know, and that's where that being in that middle ground, I think is so important because you're, you're there in the middle and it's okay to have some ideas that are, you know, conservative or right leaning or be on the left and have left, uh, and liberal leaning, that doesn't matter. That's okay. Either, either way. So when you, when I've told people that, like, it's okay if you're still, uh, conservative because most of them, when they come out, they are still right leaning. Sure. Um, so that's okay. As long as you drop the racism and the hate and, and all that, I'm, I'm happy. I don't care if you're right leaning or left leaning, as long as you're not jump into those extremes stay oh, in the middle with the rest of us you know <laughs> I know, I know. you know it, it's so interesting you were bringing up the rabbis and there's the tolerance museum out here in los angeles or the holocaust museum and when you walk in and you're in the little four-year area in the front and the guide comes out and tells you what you're going to see in the museum and blah 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 there are two big doors and one says prejudiced and the other says not prejudiced and so the guide says, you know, come on and pick which door is best for you. Of course, everybody clamors to non-prejudice, but that door is locked. <laughs> everybody has to go through the prejudice door because we all are, you know, we all have our biases. Um, you know, we don't act on them in, in, in extreme ways, most people. But I think that you know, even in the most extreme cases, it has turned the spotlight on ourselves, on our families, the stories we've told ourselves perpetually that have no basis on any, any foundation. Um, but I just think it's, that's why it's so important to meet people who aren't like you, to not stay in your box. Because, you know, just like the rabbi said, that one window might open. You know, and I'm glad you brought up the Museum of Tolerance because I, this is an important part of my story as well. And, and um, I, I can't believe I almost forgot to share it. So I'm so <laughs> glad you brought that up. But the Simon Wiesenthal Center has been phenomenal in, in um, they've been so kind to me and, and they've helped with uh, when I, uh, bringing me to speak at a synagogue and different things like that. I've met Rabbi Cooper, one of the leaders of the, of the Wiesenthal Center. The Wiesenthal Center was something that when I was in the movement, those people to me were scary, you know, like those, those were, they'll hunt you down type of, that's yeah. the idea. And when Never I got out, <laughs> when I got out and I, and I started the, the moment 
they knew that I was out. A good friend, of, he's a, currently a good friend of mine, Rick Eaton from the Simon Wiesenthal Center. He flew out to Detroit uh, to meet with me and, and we talked and they were one of the first groups, uh, first individuals and, and groups to reach out to me when I got out. And um, one organization that I 100% uh, support, of course, besides uh, Beyond Barriers, is the Simon Wiesenthal Center. They've been absolutely incredible. They understand um, how, you know, to get people out. They are also nonpartisan like, like we are. So um, I have a lot in common with them and, and they've been absolutely incredible on, on this journey because to be honest, Rolanda, when I first got out of the movement, I, the racism was gone when I, when I was leaving. The racism was kind of gone while I was still in there. I did things backwards. Like I was, you should disengage and then de-radicalize. In my case, I was de-radicalizing before I disengaged because I was the, the head of the organization and I was making up excuses to stay and, and struggling with leaving and all these kind of things. But um, when I met with the Wiesenthal Center, right around that time, when I first got out, I was still struggling with anti-Semitism. Racism was gone, but anti-Semitism was so deeply ingrained, I was struggling with it. And my Jewish friends and people that I've, I've met since then have, you know, I was long past that by um, in 2019, thankfully. But uh, that's something that I struggled with. And I see a lot of people struggling with it that are coming out, especially people from the organization I was part of because it was so anti-Semitic. So um, introducing- Maybe that's why it's so important that they that they show up when you are in transition, you know, that window. <laughs> The window again, yeah. The window, I love that. I love that imagery. <laughs> yeah, that's great. The In the barrier, you know? Good stuff, good stuff. So what have been your proudest moments in all, in all of, well, I could say your whole life. <laughs> I mean, but really working with people. I mean, what have been some of the moments when you, when you say, Jeff, man, you're doing, you're doing the right thing. You're, you're doing God's work or whatever, however you say. Ooh, that's a good question. Um, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one. Stump me a little bit. Um, there's so there's so many things. Um, um, I think you know one of the motivating factors and and uh, reasons that I do the things I do now and speaking out is because I feel like I need to repair. Um, no one's making me do it. No one's saying I should do it or anything like that. But I just feel this sense of responsibility for all of the people that I radicalized that I brought into that movement. There's mm -hmm. countless, countless people, not just into the NSM, but even after I got out, I had people emailing and stuff like that going, I never joined, but you inspired me. And how dare you leave and, and things like that. So it's like, I've done a lot of damage uh, through my rhetoric and, and words over the years. So for me, this is my way of giving something back, doing the right thing. I, I understand business. I ran a successful business. That's another thing. My business was tied into the movement. So I, uh, I let that go as well when I got out. So, I mean, I basically, my way of, of earning a living was in, involved in it and everything. My whole life was tied up into this stuff. You know, so for me, it was more important to do the right thing than to do what would have been the, e the easier thing. You know, usually people um, I'm not aware of anybody else in the United States that's left when they were on top in in the, or their organization or in in that in that field. And that's not something I'm proud of, but it's it's very unique in that sense, because it's so much easier to stay there and, and because you're comfortable, you know that and, and uh, all that. But for me, once I realized what I was doing was wrong, I, I consider myself somebody that, that follows like principles. I, like I'm an honorable person. I, I want to be noble. I want to do good things. So once I realized what I was doing was not honorable and noble, there was like this, it, it was like t tearing away on the insides, you know, these, things were tearing away at me um, going, you can't, you can't do this. You can't, you can't stay involved in this, Jeff. And not only that, you can't just leave and go into business or something else. You need to go and fix this. Hmm. All right. Wow. How do you forgive yourself? Um, is that work? You have to work on that or is that part of the journey? 
Yes, yes, it is. And I've, I've, I've been asked that before. And, and I, and, and I don't I, mean that in a mean way. I mean that no, I in know. like, what are the steps you take? Because there, there has to be a lot of leaving it there and forgiving yourself or forgiving what that whole thing, you know, so you can move on. You have to forgive the past. You're right. And um, it's a lot of times it's easier said than done. And I've, I feel I've said that, you know, like, yes, I've forgiven myself and things like that. And I've had people ask this. And, and one time I was speaking at a, at a place and there was a, 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 a black woman that had um, some connection uh, through her family to Dr. L uh, Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. And um, she had said she go, she come up and hug me after after my speech and and said, you know, Jeff, you need to forgive yourself. And I said, I've, I've done that. I'm, I'm done that. And she goes, no, you haven't, Jeff. You need to do it now. What you're doing is important. You need to think about what you're doing now. Don't beat yourself up over the past. And it's been interesting because her and then a few Jewish uh, friends of mine have said almost the exact same thing. Um, so hearing that from communities that were affected directly by, you know, things that I had said or done in the past. Um, it's, it's really, it's phenomenal. It's, it's an, it's an incredible, um, it's, it's just incredible. Um, but, you know, I think by, to answer your question, the, the forgiveness, I think through the work that I'm doing now and actually truly helping others and truly doing something that's positive and, and noble, that to me is, is my way of giving back. It's, I, I was a little nervous sending you that, that, that message. I thought, Oh man, what does she say? You know, screw you, Jeff, you know, or, or something, you know, that's, that's the first thing uh, for years and years. I always look at like, what is the worst case scenario? So everything else is like a positive surprise. And uh, usually it's not worst case scenario, but uh, thank you so much. I, that, that was really meaningful to hear, hear from you as well. Yeah, well, I'm just so proud of the man that you're becoming and a very becoming man. And uh, just, I just, I'm just blown away. I just think it's just so fantastic. Now, you're not going to flip back. Nothing in your head is going to make you flip back and act. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. And, you know, there's, there's people, that's a, that's a good question, actually. Thank no. you. It's like, can we believe it? Because, you know, people are going to be like, mm -hmm. you know, once, once in the KKK, always in the KKK. And there's people that feel that way. Um, but, and it's a question and, you know, so, sometimes I get asked that question and it, it, and I get annoyed by it because I think like, and I shouldn't be, but it's, it's when you've been in on this journey and you understand like when you leave, okay. So there's a lot of people, most of the people that we work with leave, they don't do this speaking out. Speaking out is hard, especially because you have, you know, you're admitting you were wrong as a man, you know, we're talking about a hyper-masculine uh, movement, you know, and you're coming out and you're saying, you know, I was wrong. And that's one of the things the Wiesenthal Center, uh, my friend Rick had said, I said, you know, I'm going to speak out. And he goes, are you, you, uh, you think you're going to be okay doing that? You know? And I said, man, I've been speaking 27 years. It's what I do. I'm a public speaker. <laughs> Easy, no problem. And he just kind of smirked. He's like, "Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Uh, we watched you before. You know, we've we've, we've monitored we've you. Heard you. <laughs> oh, very well." He goes, um, "But he goes, this is a lot different, Jeff." He says, "You're not going to be up uh, railing against illegal immigration or, or things like that. You're going to be talking about yourself." And I said, ah, eh. "You know, I just kind of brushed it off, like it's not going to be so hard." Oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> Oh, he was right. He was right. This is a hot, I mean, standing in front of a room full of people and, and explaining to them, Hey, I was wrong. Going from being the leader of a Nazi organization where everything you say is right to the people that, that are there to actually admitting like, Hey, that was wrong. It was terrible. It was hurtful to people. And, and now uh, doing this. Yeah, it's definitely Definitely not the same thing, but I, I'm so glad and, and uh, honored to be able to do it. But as, as far as your question about flipping back, now that is something that, that people wonder about sometimes. And if someone leaves and they're not public, like uh, it happens all the time where people leave the movement and then they'll go back in. Um, if they've spoken out, 
like what I do and like what a number of the other uh, individuals that are public do, there is no going back because the movement sees you as a traitor. You're right. We just wouldn't, we would have back then. Um, there's a story I remember where we heard one of our members had went to his local church because we, we had other people at the church as well. And they said, Hey, so-and-so got up in front of the church during the service and the minister brought him up there and he apologized for being in the movement and being a racist and all that kind of stuff. And um, a couple of years later, someone had brought up that individual and they said, Hey, do you think we should try to bring him back? I, you know, I heard maybe we could try to bring him back. I said, no, we, can, we don't bring anybody back that spoke out. He got in front of his church and, and disrespected the movement. He can't <laughs> be brought back. What are you saying? You know, so no, there is no going back. So when people say that about uh, those that have spoken out, um, it's literally almost impossible. And, it's very and why would you go back after you went through all of this fire to get where you are? Exactly. And, exactly. and how, how many people will hold you accountable because you're so needed. Do you ever think that it's something, a power bigger than you, that's driving you to be this, this, this soldier, man, this soldier. I, th I think so. Um, you know, I, it's one of the things too, when I was going through this, this time period where I was meeting some of these incredible individuals and, and starting to be able to see their humanity, I was going through in my personal life, like some of the most tragic time period um, that I had, that I ever had in my personal life. You know, my mother died and my grandparents passed away all at once. And my dog that had been with me for 17 years uh, went, it was just one death wow. after another and loss and loss and loss. So it, it was, um, you know, it kind of puts human life into perspective when you start seeing loved ones around you passing away. And, and I, I, I think back on this stuff and I should have saw it sooner because even in the movement, I mean, it, the movement leaves like this trail of death and destruction. And I, I know people that have, you know, went away from murder, people that have murdered, you know, killed themselves, people that have harmed others. It's just, it's just a, a nonstop uh, train wreck of this, of destruction and death and sorrow. And, and, uh, and you just like condition yourself to, uh, you know, like, Oh, this is what we do. This is for the cause. And, um, it's, it's such a negative thing to be involved in. Mm -hmm. Well, I am so glad that you turned the corner and I'm going to ask one last question. How do you explain to your dates what you used to do? <laughs> ah. <laughs> I mean, when you're telling a lady, let me tell you about my life. <laughs> How's that, that working for you? <laughs> <laughs> when I was in the movement, it was whenever I would meet a girl's, if I dated a girl in the movement, that was easy because she was already there. She knew about it. Right. Most of the time I was dating girls from outside of the movement and we'd have dates and stuff and they'd be like, well, what do you do? I said, well, I run a music label, which was true but I didn't tell them it was a white power music label. You know, right, that right. came later, you know, if they'd ask questions about it, I'd skirt around it. And then eventually I like have a sit down conversation with them. And you, you know, your, your heart would just sink like, okay, is this girl going to throw a glass of water in my face and walk out? Is she going to call me a liar? Even though I didn't lie, but I was being misleading um, or, or not fully truthful maybe. So it wasn't necessarily, well, I didn't lie. I just didn't share that part with you, you know, and it was, it was so stressful and some would accept it um, because they had already gotten to know me and said, well, I, I don't, uh, you know, uh, one of my best friends today is a, is an ex-girlfriend of mine. And, and she said to this day, and we've known each other for years, she has not looked me up on the internet. She goes, I don't want to, I don't want to know see what they say about you. I know some it's things bad. you can't unsee. So even now, even now being out, um, sometimes uh, when, you know, you, it's still hard. It's like, I don't want to tell people um, like, hey, I used to be this guy and now I do this because they get, sometimes they get scared and mm -hmm. they think, well, people might be coming after you. Am I in danger? Is it dangerous to be around you? 
um, these kind of things. So it's it's still it's still a delicate issue to talk about. Even even now, of course, people are more you know receptive now because it's something good. It really is something good that I'm doing, not just that I thought was good. Oh, it's something crucial that you're doing. Something right. crucial. Jeff, I don't know how you do it, but I sure hope you keep on doing it. And yeah. I'm just so profoundly proud of you. I mean, you're a really good guy. I mean, just in what I'm picking up here. And, I, you know, like I said, 25 years ago, I kind of got a little hint that um, there was a lot more good to you than, than, than what you believed. Yeah, good stuff. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm Rolanda Watts. And this is Rolanda On Demand. Jeff is today running a nonprofit organization called Beyond Barriers, where he is hoping to get especially young people out of extremist groups and leave hate behind. This was a wonderful story to break on Martin Luther King Day. And I hope it keeps hope alive for those of us who want to see a better nation, a more tolerant nation, a more diverse and inclusive nation, because that's what America's about. It's about my little part of this quilt, maybe of a different texture and a different hue, but I fit here. I fit here in America, just like you. Thank you so much for tuning in. Let me know what you think in the comments and go out there and do something good. Hey guys, just a quick reminder that my voice acting masterclass is gonna be starting up this spring. I'd love to help you get where you wanna go with that voice. You know you've always been told you have a great voice. Well, let me teach you some acting skills to put behind it and you never know what could happen. Give me a call at Rolanda.com. That's R-O-L-O-N-D-A.com. Some of you watch the Seinfeld show. Many of you may know Jason Alexander, who plays George on that show. He is also joining a movement, but it's a fight against racism. And he's doing it with this message from the Anti-Defamation League. My wife and I had a son, a perfect little boy. And suddenly I looked at the world in which he'd live and was terrified. Hate crimes don't just devastate their victims. They reach past individuals to strike at the very heart of communities. The best response is to fight, to unite under the banner of decency, equality, respect. I want to give my son a better, wiser, more loving world than this one. Hey y'all, I can't wait to see you in my voice acting masterclass. For those of you who are really serious about becoming voice actors, this is the opportunity for you. In six weeks, you will be in a totally different place as an artist. And I wanna help you put that voice to work. Go to Rolanda.com and check it out. You'll see the details of what I offer and you might wanna even set up a discovery call to see if this is the right fit for you. But stop hesitating, stop waiting, stop putting off, stop going, well, cause it'll always be an excuse. Take control of your life, take action now. Be a voice actor and come work with me, Rolanda.com. Hey guys, Manny Cabo here. You guys might recognize me from tiny little show on NBC called The Voice, or Telemundo's La Voz, or maybe even one of the lead singers of the Wizards of Winter Christmas Spectacular. I'm here to talk to you guys about Rolando Watts' masterclass for voiceover artist. I got to tell you, when I first delved into this industry, so many of my friends would say, Manny, you want to learn voiceovers? You got to take Rose class. And they hit the nail on the head with this one. Because after the six-week intensive masterclass, not only did I feel inspired and empowered, but above all educated with all the latest trends and tips and techniques from industry professionals that Rolanda will bring on to showcase to help you leverage your skills as well. So folks, if you're looking to really up your game and delve into the voiceover world, then take Rolanda Watts Masterclass. You'll be glad you did. And Rolanda, Thank you so much for inspiring me to continue to do the things that I love with my voice. You're a rock star. And for those of you out there looking for the best voiceover masterclass, Rolanda's the way to go. Oh, and by the way, you're welcome. Take care, guys, and good luck.
Hey there, all you aspiring voice actors. Michelle Brown here. I'm actually here in Times Square for the first time in a long time, but I just wanted to take a moment to let you know that I just wrapped up Rolanda's voice acting masterclass, and wow, it was amazing. Rolanda is a lot of fun. Her class is chock full of useful information that will get you started in your career. And she brings in all these great seasoned pros with great tips that you are just going to love. So go ahead, sign up for Rolanda's voice acting masterclass. You know you want to. This is about you. This is about your choices and your dreams and ultimately what you want to be. And how do you get started to do all those wonderful voiceover things? You go and you meet and talk to Rolanda Watts. You do that consultation thing, that little 15 minute thing that she got on Rolanda.com. That's what you do. That is how you get started. I called and I knew what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to take Rolanda's class and it did not disappoint. Let me tell you why. One of the things Rolanda teaches you right off the fly is when you're prepared, you are no longer scared. And I keep that and hold that very true to myself now because now I do feel a lot more prepared and I'm not quite as nervous jumping into new terrain and going in and creating my demo because of taking this class. One of the things Rolanda focuses on is your values, the value of your voice. Um, what makes you unique? What's your special sauce? What makes you special? What makes you you and stand out um, and marketable? Of course, you got to keep that little business mindset on the side as well. You're also going to be in a class with others who are really eager to learn as well. There are fellow voiceover artists ranging from novice to those who are already professionals that are just hungry and eager to learn. In this voiceover industry business, you're going to be learning all the time. So why not learn from the best? Truthfully, why just not learn from the best? If you can, if you have the means, I would do it. Remember, this is your story. This is my story. This is the path that I chose. And it's led me in a really, really good direction. Take that 15 minute call. You won't regret it.